Hello and welcome to Fuse from PRCA. My name's Dan Gold and on today's episode we are talking about an area of humanity, not communications, not marketing, not PR, not advertising, not anything else, but an area of humanity that we just need to get right. We're on that journey and we are talking equity, diversity and inclusion. On today's episode, Advita Patel, founder of Comms Rebel, a communications consultancy focused on making a real difference in how people feel at work. Advita is a straight talker, qualified coach, and a true rebel with a cause. Now, from everything I know, from a conference that I went to in Vancouver a number of years ago, there was a buzz around comms rebels. And I know that Advita's worked in in this industry, I know, over 20 years. So, you know, to cut to the chase, Advita, welcome to Fuse. Hi, thanks, Dan. I'm really excited to be here today. We've spoken before this episode about what we were going to discuss. And one of the things that really came through was the fact that you're, yes, a communications professional, but through your own personal experiences, you wanted to bring change. And it's change for the better, for sure. Let's start from one place. Why equity, diversity, and inclusion, rather than the convention of diversity, equity, inclusion? Um, a really good question. And it, you know what? It does depend on where you are based. So when we wrote our books, when Priya and I co-authored our book, Building a Culture of Inclusivity, we had to aim it towards the kind of North American audience, which call it diversity, equity, and inclusion. Actually, we had a bit of a debate about the using the word equity over equality and we'll get into that a little bit more but for me I do prefer equity diversity and inclusion because I believe that you need equity first before you can move forward with anything else and it is a tough thing to bring in equity I'm not saying it's easy it's difficult and I think that's why a lot of pe- lot of people prefer to talk about equality and about fairness because equity can be uncomfortable for some individuals as well. How did your role change? And was there an aha moment where you went, okay, I'm really great at doing this. I'm really comfortable at doing this, but this is what I really want to be doing. Mm -hmm. Such a good question. I, it, it was a very, it was a natural progression, Dan, to be honest. If what happened with me was, I was a little bit tired of working in corporate organizations doing the same thing over and over again and not really seeing the change I wanted to see because of fear and uncertainty in leaders in various organizations that I supported. And I realized that if we didn't take the risk to do something different and make change happen, things were not going to move forward. And it's that famous Einstein quote, you know, that the sign of madness is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting to see different results each time and that's what i was feeling so when i started comms rebel i knew i wanted to have an organization that helped other organizations thrive and connect better with their colleagues and employees because there was always a disconnect in my experience especially in the field of internal communication which is what my specialism is in I always saw a bit of a disconnect between the leadership and the general workforce in terms of influence and impact. If your leader was quite charismatic, then it worked, but it's very dependent on that personality. And there were gaps in in inclusion and belonging and equity and equality and diversity. And when I started Comms Rebel, I decided that I wanted to do something to help revolutionise the way we communicate and the outcome of that revolution and what that looks like, which ultimately is an inclusive culture where people can thrive. And equity, diversity and inclusion was a part of that, but not only the part of that, if that makes sense. So I don't tend to talk about EDI as a standalone topic because I feel that there's lots of individuals out there who will just switch off and say, it's not for me. You know, that's, that's for other people who are different to me. So I'm not going to pay too much attention. But as soon as you talk about inclusivity and talk about inclusive cultures and talk about belonging, everybody wants to belong and everybody wants to feel included. And then all of a sudden things change. 
the communications industry has been talking about EDI and and what we need to do, but in different organizations, in different parts of the world, I've certainly seen that there's different interpretations, not only of how this can be applied, but how people understand what it is for their communities. So just in terms of us speaking, mm-hmm. fundamentally, EDI the, and the difference between equity and equality and why it matters in identifying and recognising the difference. Yeah, and again, another great question. And this is something that people do get confused with. And equity is a fairly new term, I would say. A lot of people are familiar with equality because of the Equality Act in the UK specifically. But equity, uh, equality is where you would give Let's for for an, a, a real life example. You work in an organisation and they agree to give everybody training, right? So every colleague gets access to training, right? That's equality. That's fairness. Everybody gets access to it. Where equity comes in is looking and considering the access points for those individuals. So taking in consideration that there may be people who have English as their second language and may not may need some additional support, for example, or somebody who may not be able to afford to get to the training. So they may need some support in getting additional uh, support to get uh, transport to take them there. There may be some individuals who are neurodivergent and may need additional help to access that training in the way that helps them. And that's where equity comes in. So you would you adjust what that individual may need so they are on an equal level playing field. And this is where my passion comes out because you can say to everybody, yes, everyone's equal, everyone's got access to things, what's the problem? But you're not considering the challenges that other people may face, specifically underrepresented minorities. Where I think there's a challenge, and and certainly what you were saying in regards to equity and the difference in how people need, for example, uh, to receive training, people who are neurospicy like me, um, I know that for me, online training is not particularly great, but face to face is is really effective. But it takes an organisation, an employer, to be able to have the resource to be able to go. Well, do you know, for the percentage of people who aren't able to engage with the training in this way, we will invest this money over here. It's not the same for all organizations. As an in, and as an internal communication professional yourself, when you go in and consult with organizations, how many times do you hit barriers where they go, look, we're trying our absolute best and we're going to try and be as inclusive as we can be, but there are limits. Where is the point at which... EDI is more of a principle because this is something that practitioners struggle with day to day. Where is it a principle and where is the line where it's reasonable for an organization to go, actually, we don't have this resource or we can't invest in this or we just don't know what to do? What as a practitioner would you say to them to say, well, okay, baby steps, there are things you still can do? Mm -hmm. Well, the first question is always, what are you trying to achieve? What outcome do you want to achieve from the work that you want to do? And a lot of organisations may believe that they are doing the right thing, but when you dig a bit deeper, they are just doing some tokenistic gestures, which I will always say are more harmful than not doing anything at all, because you're leading people down a false sense of security, that you're you're basically telling these individuals that we care about you, we we see you, we hear you, we recognise the support that you need, you then bring them into your place of work because you want to be seen as this diverse organisation, but you don't have the resources available to support them to thrive. And that's dangerous. And I will always say to organisations, it's okay to say that we are taking steps in making sure that we're doing things properly. And it may mean that we need to build on this over time but these are our key priorities for the next few months and then deliver those key priorities properly with the investment and the support and then move on to your next ones and the danger of not doing that and saying that we're going to do absolutely everything and include absolutely everybody is that you are not going to end up including anyone because you're doing everything's half half-heartedly you know I worked for one organization I supported one organization I should say where I was doing an internal comms audit and in the focus group 
a number of colleagues in the room said to me that they actually have a rule on certain words that contain things like diversity, equity and inclusion, equality, um, to go into another folder because they just feel absolutely inundated and there's no rhyme or reason why they, why that comms is being distributed. We've got to touch on the area of accountability. When you go into organisations and you speak to them and you go, hey, what have you done to date? You've done the audit. You see what the slate looks like currently in that plan that this is put together. How do we keep organisations accountable for their commitments? And is it easier... Um, and this might be a divisive question, is it easier to have external oversight so that there's a reporting process which has accountability, or is there at times a system that an organisation can put in place to be accountable to maybe uh, an employee group? What what f- things can work? I think there's a, there's a range of different tactics that can work to keep people accountable. And I'm not going to beat around the bush. You know, money is a big driver. And leaders will want to know the return on investment and how much it's going to earn them and how much performance is it's going to improve. And, how, you know, and we've seen, I'm not going to bang on about the research and the studies. There's so much out there that people can look up to see the benefits of having a diverse workforce can bring. But... You know, the accountability side, there's the organisational accountability, which is really important, which you can have against some criteria that are now being put out there against, you know, in Europe, for example, there's different policies and and processes you have to follow or you're breaking the law. You know, when shareholder investment now, shareholders are asking questions around diversity and inclusion. If you look at all the ERG stuff, uh, ESG stuff, sorry, that's going on at the moment, the, the social element of it, people are being held accountable from an organisational level. You know, shareholders are not investing if the organisation can't show that they're making progress in this space. Employees are being choosy about where they're going to add value in terms of their talent, and they're asking questions at interview. The power has tipped, and it's tipping. You know, these individuals are now being more cautious about where they will put themselves in because they don't want their mental health to be impacted or their values um, not not being, you know, achieved in, in the way they want to. So that accountability sits at an organisational level to an extent. Personal accountability is something that I will always champion and I will always say to a leader that I work with, OK, you've spoken about organisational accountability, get that. What's your personal accountability to make change happen? What are you doing to make a difference? You personally doing to make a difference? Are you reading the resources that you need to read? Are you actually being an active bystander and and speaking up when you see discrimination take place in front of you or somebody facing, you know, something uh, facing into a challenge that there shouldn't be? You know, are you actually saying, hang on, why are we asking Susan? to make the tea time and time again? Why are we not asking John to go and fetch the coffee? Those are, you know, and it's not massive movements because those big challenges do put the fear in individuals. I'm talking about small ripples that can create big waves. And if everybody's aligned in speaking up and being the active bystander and taking that personal accountability and holding others accountable, things will start shifting and changing and trust will be gained and that safe space that everybody talks about will start to be built. The worrying thing for me is that increasingly we're seeing some politicisation of this in the wrong direction where people are um, politically aligned to certain political ideals which don't necessarily align with EDI, yet they may not see that the wider implication is other companies will start to consider them being a toxic organisation and not want to work with them. In terms of people being intentionally um, um, obtuse to EDI, do you think that there is effectively a wall that we can break down to take fear and politicization out of this? 
Priya and I have a quote that we often say when we work with our our respective organisations is choosing hope over fear. You know, fear can stifle innovation. It can stifle curiosity. It can stifle connection. And we as individuals have to be quite mindful about some of the propaganda and misinformation that's been shared about this work externally and do our own due diligence in this area. And there are so many individuals I feel should know better who have shared information that's inaccurate. And we have to take that, you know, we go back to that accountability piece again. We have to take personal accountability for some of the information that we are reading and taking in and balancing it out with the opposite view. And I, you know, I am on the on the side of in, inclusive cultures because I've seen the benefits of bringing in inclusion and diversity and the thriving cultures it can contribute towards. And I know the reason some people don't want that done is because they're scared. You know, they're fearful of what does this mean for me because the privileges that have been afforded to me for the rest, all my life are suddenly not going to be there anymore. And I'm actually going to have to work hard or harder than I have had to work before. And I'm not talking about, you know, I know there's this kind of negative connotation around white privilege, but I'm talking about privilege as a whole. I have privilege, you have privilege, we all have privileges. But there are certain individuals who have, whose privileges have afforded them the opportunities that other people may not have had just because of their skin colour or because they're able or because they, you know, that the, their gender. And that's something that you need, we and everybody else needs to recognise and be and be okay with that to an extent and not get defensive. And that's where, you know, that's where that personal accountability side does come in. Have you ever been brought into an organisation or has, has an organisation come to you and said, hey, we want to roll this thing out. We want to get it in. We want to get it done. And you realise in your due diligence that this is performative, they're not actually going to bring any change. It's a tick box exercise and you get rid of that client or you don't want to engage with them. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I have a very rigorous um, process before I take a client on board and it's very important for me and my own values to be able to do that. And I get it, you know, some individuals don't recognise they're being tokenistic or performative, to be honest. And that is uncomfortable for them to recognize that and what i will always say to individuals it's okay to feel uncomfortable it's okay to sit in that moment it's okay to reflect and understand where you may have contributed to some of those systemic challenges in that organization that i found through discussions and it is you know it's it's a tough one dan because people are people in my experience you know 90 percent of the time are not malicious at all you know, they, they are good, kind people who want to do good things. Where the mistakes or, or challenges may have happened is through their own lived experiences and not having the community around them to give them that education that may have contributed to some of their thinking. And I will always say to your point, you know, and you made such a great point there about expanding your network and expanding your community, reading the books that you would never, ever have picked up a year ago, you know, expanding. We're in a world right now where we can connect with people from the other side of the world so much easier than we've ever had in our lives before. And we need to take advantage of that. You know, and I will always say, I always give an activity to people and for the listeners, you know, look, write down your top 15 people in your inner circle who you often get advice from or listen to or uh, influence your decision making. And once you've written them down, have a look at the pattern in terms of the characteristics and the demographics of those individuals. And I will tell you there will be a pattern because I did it myself. And being a brown woman in comms, you know, uh, interested in inclusion, my biases completely came through on my list. And I had to make adjustments to make sure that I expanded my community, welcomed in a new friendship circle and stopped the barriers and blockers myself that I put in place unintentionally, I, I felt or unconsciously, if you, if you want to say that, and, and make the make an effort. And I don't think that is beyond anyone's, you know, work. I, I know people are busy and there's things going on, but being intentional with how you're communicating with others and the information that you're taking in is, is it should be a fairly easy ask, to be honest. 
are there soft skills that we can in, insert into organizations in encouraging them to look at how culture is embraced and differences are embraced in in terms of programs that you can work with organizations not just going hey here's the internal comms piece it's that kind of icing on the cake bit sorry yeah. another food reference <laughs> well i i um call them human skills dan because i feel that they're just as equally important as the technical skills that we bring into the organizations and that's exactly what they are right the humanizing of the relationships that we have with individuals and we have to work harder right now to your you know to, to your examples are incredible in terms of the food you know, bringing people together, the, looking at the differences, but also the similarities, right? You know, we're not that different from each other, but yet we are different enough to be curious about each other's culture and religion and, and background and lived experiences. Because let's be honest, if we're all exactly the same, how boring would that be? Mm -hmm. If we all looked exactly the same, behaved exactly the same, had a similar education, it'd be tedious and boring and, and nothing would actually be vibrant and different and bold, you know, and disruptive and, and making things a bit more exciting. When we talk about the human side of the kind of tech, the abilities that we have to bring into the workplace, regardless of what role you play, it is about connection. And it is about asking curious questions. And I'm not saying you know, being, um, what's the word, you know, that there was a whole drama in the UK over the Queen's um, aide who asked, you know, where are you from? Where are you from? Mm -hmm. Where are you from? I mean, that's inappropriate. We all know that. I think most people understand that. And I'm not talking about that type of questioning, but I'm talking about the curious type of questioning of, that's really interesting. Would you help me understand how that works in your culture? Oh, that's really, you know, that's great. And you would do this in a in a very informal manner as you would if you're making a cup of tea in the kitchen. The challenge now, Dan, as I said before, is that we're now working from home a lot of the time and we've got a screen that separates us. And what I've recognised when I'm doing uh, audits and stuff in organisations is that there's none of that kind of water cooler type of conversation, the coffee, tea making, chit chat about what you watched on Netflix the night before. It's straight down to business on those calls and what's happening because you get straight down to business you're losing the connectivity between the two people or the number of people in the room where you may have uncovered some similarities about your upbringing or your lived experiences but also the differences that make you who you are and people are now reluctant to share that and you know when the cameras are off as well or people are not feeling safe enough to be who they need to be, it's bringing that tension. So now what, what I'm witnessing is that a lot of people are rejecting the notion of equity, diversity and inclusion because they think it's, uh, it's, it's segregating communities rather than bringing communities together. But I genuinely believe that it's not any fault of EDI. It's the fact that we are now working in a very flexible way which means that we have to be even more intentional about building connection. And we we have to, that personal accountability piece again, think and reflect on what are you doing to make that additional effort to connect with your colleague that you may not see on a daily basis. If I can just go to the internal communication side of your expertise and the knowledge and your experience, do you think an element of remote working and getting straight into business, getting straight onto it, getting out the call because we don't want to be sat on calls all day, is also the disconnect, which then has an unintentional consequence. I think this is where we're kind of speaking. The unintended consequence is that there's depersonalization and then the efforts of EDI can almost start to fall on deaf ears because people are just disconnecting and it's unintentional, but it's kind of a consequence of the remote working. And look, I'm not going to say to any organization, you must have all your people back in the office. And like, I'm not one of those people. I worked remotely for the last near decade. We worked hard to maintain that relationship. Yeah. Um, before we start to wrap this up, an important question that people have asked me about cultures within our organization is we've heard 
more than once, many times, that there are great resources out there go to the library, read official sources of information, talk to community groups to really get educated. Where is the balance we were talking about? And and this is where I like to talk about getting it right within the workplace. Where is that balance to say, hey, I'm interested in your culture. I'm interested in, in you as a human being and and your community and how that fits with my community and those you know commonalities the world all around the world we have soup and we have dumplings it doesn't matter what culture you come from there is soup and there is dumplings (laughs) how do we help people understand the right line of being inquisitive without using your colleague as the font of all knowledge or as the library of the whole of their culture and getting that response of go read a book or go whatever it is. But where is that balance and how can people navigate that empathetically? You have to do your homework and you have to make sure, you know, reading the book, reading books and listening to podcasts and watching webinars and stuff, it's a, it's a key part of education, right? And, and knowledge building, but also connecting with those communities that you want to be an ally for. And what is it that they are saying? You know, what are they talking about? What are their frustrations? What adversity are they facing on a regular basis? And what have you learned about that? That is what will evoke that curiosity in those conversations that you're having without putting the ownership on one individual in your organization that just happens to belong to that community. And I, you know, if you, we can tell when people are being genuine in terms of the interest in who we are and what we do. And we need to be okay with asking the question, are you okay for asking a couple of questions? And I'm really interested because I read this really interesting book about X, Y, and Z, or watch this webinar about, and I'd love to get your thoughts on it. What do you think? And people then have the option to say, do you know what? It's not really my bag. I don't really want to talk about it. And that's okay. And and respect that and say, okay, that's absolutely fine. Yeah, I, I get it. And But we just have this real fear, Dan, of having uncomfortable conversations and, you know, making assumptions as well as part of our, our biases at times. And I have never once seen anybody feel begrudged when someone is genuinely interested about them and their culture and their religion or their or their experiences or their career. Those kind of questions are, you know, like I like when people come to me and say, so tell me about your journey into comms. How did you get into it? You know, what what inspired you? Who inspired you? Those are the kind of inquisitive questions that you can learn a lot about. And, and you'll get a lot from that rather than saying, oh, you're a bit different. Where are you from? You know, and it's different, right? Different ways of asking those questions. And you'll probably, you know, just imagine the difference and how you're making that individual feel in terms of belonging. We've spoken and referred to the book. Please, can you tell us um, in brief about the book and where we could get it? So Building a Culture of Inclusivity is a book that I co-authored, sorry, with Priya Bates. And we wanted to write a book for leaders and communication professionals and HR leaders who are responsible for communicating within the organization around inclusive practices. To your point, Dan, you know, there's a lot of information out there, a myriad of information that you can get lost in. And the feedback that Priya and I often heard from our network and communities and clients that we spoke with is that they're overwhelmed. So Priya and I spent a good, you know, five and a half month, five and a half months, sorry, putting together a book that has all the information or a starting point for information for anyone who's interested in building a culture of inclusivity. So we did the research, we've done the studies. The first part is all about the why. So why does DEI matter? And what does that look like? And then the second part are actual tools, frameworks, models, and practical tips and techniques to help you implement a culture of inclusivity. So we, we split it in two because we know there are some people who get it and but need the tools to help. And there are some people who don't quite get it and need a bit of persuasion. And that's how, how we've done it. And it's, it was a great project to work on with Priya. And we're immensely proud of the book itself and the work that it's and the and the work it's supporting out there. And I do have to say that throughout the international 
Malcolm's industry, this is a book that gets referred to and brought up in conversations a lot. So I highly recommend that people do check that out. Um, if people wanted to find out more information about you and the organization, how could they do that? Uh, they can follow me on any of the social platforms under Coms Rebel or Advita underscore P, the privilege of having a unique name, or you can visit uh, commsrebel.com. And if you want to find out more about um, the book and the assessment we've got alongside the book as well. So if you want to check out how inclusive your organization is, you can go to a leader like me.com. Avita Patel, thank you so much for joining us here on Fuse. Thank you so much, Dan. Thank you so much for checking out this episode of Fuse. Please do share this with colleagues. I think there are some incredible takeaways from this and actually other episodes that we have produced. Go back to the start of the feed. There are some incredible episodes. If you'd like to find out more information about each and every episode, simply go to prca.org.uk forward slash Fuse or search for PRCA Fuse on your favourite podcast app. Thank you.